So welcome to Faves 19. Um, we're super excited to be back here today. We had a little bit of a longer hiatus between sessions and we're kind of doing every three weeks for kind of the summer, but we'll get back to probably twice a month, a little bit later in the fall. Um, so I'm gonna be passing it over to Steph, who's gonna kind of chair this event like last time, but just a couple words um, before that, just to remind everyone that um, we, the point of faves, we don't really get into this a lot, but we really want to encourage dialogue uh, between everyone in the phage community around the world. Um, so more than 80 countries worth of phage people uh, are represented among this community and they come to these events and get our newsletters and um, this is kind of like the meetup and like we're trying to go for a more casual vibe. So you're really coming here to be a person who is not just like a name on a publication somewhere. And then we want to give this platform to share ideas and really cool progress that everybody is making in the phage field. And um, today is one of the, we started recently having more of a clinical kind of stream. And so I've just been weaving that in and not really making a big deal about it, um, kind of weaving it into the research based ones that we've been having. And so today, uh, marks one of those. So Dr. Amine Katami is here and she's a clinician. And this is really because of a, uh, the community has been saying a lot at lots of phage conferences, especially phage therapy conferences that, you know, the clinicians are really not part of the conversation enough when we're talking about phage research and biotech. And we have so many of those perspectives represented. And so this is kind of our way of trying to weave those um, different perspectives in. So I'm super happy to have her here to talk about the clinical perspective and especially the pediatric clinical perspective. But I'm gonna pass it to Steph now, who's gonna give you more, more about her, more about our speaker today. So go ahead, Steph. Thanks, Jessica. And I'll just quickly say, yes, welcome to everyone um, joining us today for our 19th phase, which is very exciting. Um, I thought just before I introduce Amine, I would quickly remind everyone that the seminar will be 20 to 30 minutes um, and then we'll be followed by 10 minute question time. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the talk, just put them in the chat and I can read them out at the end or there will be a chance for you to unmute and ask your question yourself. Um, we'll also be ending um, today with a small casual networking. So um, that will just be using the breakout rooms and that won't be recorded. So it'd be really great if you could stick around for that. So now I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Amine Katami, who is a, a senior lecturer in child and adolescent health for the University of Sydney. Amine is also a pediatric physician at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. And very excitingly, in 2019, Amina was in collaboration with um, John Iredell and his team, where the was the first clinician in Australia to successfully treat um, a child with phage therapy for a pseudomonas bone infection. So um, obviously this was a huge success and has led to many more exciting cases, which hopefully we may um, hear about today in Amina's talk titled, um, Phage Therapy for Difficult to Treat Infections in Children. So thank you, Amina. Thank you for that very kind introduction and um, thank you for everyone for being here and listening and I hope this talk will be interesting for both clinicians and the scientist community. Um, I have to say that there, there are people in the seminar at the moment who have contributed to this work so thank you all and um, I will be acknowledging their work as well and, and this really is a very collaborative effort so um, hopefully that will be um, apparent in the talk. So I'll just get started. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be talking it from a clinician's perspective, but very specifically from a, um, a pediatrician's perspective, really. Um, <clears throat> so I, I won't labor the point of um, what phase therapy is, because I think a lot of people on this call um, are quite familiar, um, but essentially from a clinician's perspective, um, phages offer a very, um, uh, you know, that they have a very adjunctive role to antibiotics and they have certain advantages, which we're very excited about. And the first being obviously low toxicity. Um, so in all the phage use that has been used to date, there's been no recorded episode of anaphylaxis with phage therapy, which um, is, you know, is great. Um, there is a very brief systemic inflammatory response, which is sometimes seen, which is 
probably related to the release of pro-inflammatory um, cellular components like, like, like lipopolysaccharides um, from the lyse bacteria. But this is usually very self-limited um, and doesn't really cause any um, major concerns. The second important factor is that um, there are very minimal impacts to the human microbiome. Um, which plays a very critical role in uh, both health and disease states uh, in humans. Antibiotic-induced dysbiosis is a very real concern, but it is very poorly understood and in the long term may carry consequences for both inflammatory conditions, metabolic conditions, as well as immune modulation. The, sec the third point is that obviously one of the reasons why everyone is really excited about phage therapy is as a way of tackling the antimicrobial um, resistance issue globally. But it's not just a solution for AMR. In fact, actually, it reduces the selection for increasing AMR. The use of broad spectrum antibiotics drives selection for multi-resistant organisms, both at, you know, among the pathogenic population at the site of infection, but clearly also amongst um, the other microbes in all the, 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 the gut, the skin, and every other niche in the human body. And this rising AMR is a critical global health concern and security concern on a population level. But importantly, for individual patients, it severely limits our treatment options. And the other really exciting thing about phages is that obviously they can um, be used, or specific phages can be used to resensitize bacteria to, um, to, to, to antibiotics that they had previously become resistant to. There is now really great evidence of the excellent um, penetration of um, uh, phages into biofilms, and biofilms represent one of the, the, the most difficult to treat infections um, because of the way the uh, bacteria shielded from the action of antibiotics in biofilms. So with a lot of um, prosthetic device infections, um, lung infections and cystic fibrosis, these are um, characterized by biofilm formation where antibiotics just don't work very well. And the use of phages either as alternatives or adjuncts to antibiotics may enable both higher cure rates um, as well as shortening treatment durations. So those are all the good things, but the reality is that there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of challenges associated with phage therapy. And from a pediatrician's perspective, um, and these are probably the same for any clinician, they can be grouped into um, maybe four or five different categories. The first is that there is an absence of standardized protocol for dosing, for duration, and how do you actually monitor and the solution to this is that we need to have really good rigorous clinical trials and large patient um, registries with standardized data collection. There's also um, an absence at the moment of validated diagnostic surrogates to, to monitor for clinical efficacy. And so one of the things I'm gonna be focusing on when I present some cases is this importance of doing therapeutic phage monitoring, not just giving the phages and hoping things will get better, but actually trying to understand what are the distribution kinetics, what are the interactions between the phage, the bacteria and the human host, including the, the, the immune response to the, to the treatment. Clearly supply is an issue um, and this is variable depending on the pathogen of interest and the process of identifying a useful therapeutic, um, a therapeutically useful lytic phage often involves a very detailed and lengthy process of matching your pathogen against a large library of phages. But the problem with that um, is the actual, that process can be often quite time consuming. Um, and so there's sort of two models for doing this. You can either do the, you know, the phage cocktail model. So you have these off the shelf, um, easily patentable um, combinations of antibiotic, uh, sorry, of phages, which could be used um, almost syndromically um, compared to the magistral phage model where you have a very bespoke or precision medicine model of, of treating. This can be supported um, with increasing or developing um, artificial intelligence platforms, which will help to speed up that matching process. But what's critical here is both public-private partnerships to allow that supply to be available in a, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner, which is clinically meaningful. 
Um, and on top of that, you also need investment from governments and from health agency into the infrastructure that's required, into the biobanking facilities, into the linked um, good manufacturing practice facilities, the GMP um, uh, facility, so that your supply and your manufacturing process processes are linked um, and easily accessible and distributable. And clearly overlying all of this is regulation. Um, in most jurisdictions around the world, the regulation that exists is outdated. It's not fit for purpose for phages. Um, and when you bring in um, the option of synthetic or you know, genetically engineered phages, that um, creates a whole <laughs> extra level of headaches, um, which the, the, the frameworks are just not ready for at the moment. And what we need now is seminars like this, but communities like the one that we're all part of, where you have the scientific community who are able to generate the evidence being partnered with the consumers and with the regulators so that pragmatic frameworks can be developed. And specifically for the clinician community, as a lot of scientists have discovered the absence of the clinicians in conferences and seminars, it's this unfamiliar familiarity, which is a huge problem. Um, Despite the fact that phages are ubiquitous in every environment, including the human microbiome, they're really neglected in the medical and microbiology curriculum. You know, students just aren't being taught about this. And as a whole, the medical community has very limited experience with the use of therapeutic phages. And so it's important that we promote learning and through that, both clinician and consumer confidence by collecting standardized data that's easily accessible. Um, and then this greater education of medical professionals will also enable this an appropriate public health messaging so that the, the true benefits um, and where there is real potential can be portrayed to, to, to the public. So what are the opportunities in pediatrics? Um, the first is that the safety of phage therapy in children has been pretty well established. So children were included in, in um, large clinical trials early on, um, and recent pediatric case series have all demonstrated very minimal side effects um, associated with phage therapy, even with prolonged phage therapy. And so this sort of risk averse nature of the drug development pipeline, which often asks for things to be developed in adults before children, it's really not warranted for phage therapy because we know it's safe. And there's no reason why children can't be involved in quite early clinical phase trials along with adults. And it's really important to do that because actually the inclusion of children, it's not just about benefits to, to the child patients. Actually, they provide additional data which you don't get from adults. For example, in, when you're looking at the host immune response to phage therapy, there are age-related differences in the immune response between children and adults. And these are important insights we get when you include children in such clinical trials. And just thinking about it, as I said, from a pediatrician's perspective, you know, children probably have more to gain um, from eradicating difficult or problematic infections, because essentially, if you are able to restore the normal growth and development of an organ, you get substantial benefits in terms of life expectancy and long-term burden of care. And so often, because children are seen as both contributing less to the healthcare burden um, and also being a, a smaller market share, um, they're not financially... Um, there's no financial incentives really to include children in, in trials, um, but actually if you take the long picture, um, there, you know, there really is. So, so yeah, so this is me putting in a plug to say that children, it's essential that children are included in future early phase clinical trials of phase therapy to ensure that when this promising modality is more widely accessible, it is widely accessible across the age, um, the, the lifespan. Um, so this is just a brief table outlining some of the publications that are available um, at the moment um, of, you know, phase therapy being used in children. And so, yes, there's small numbers, but overwhelmingly, it's clear that there, there really isn't any safety concerns. And if anybody wants, the references are here. So what are the outstanding questions? Um, I think for, for all clinicians, the, the sort of main um, research or clinical um, questions that are outstanding are 
how do you validate the in vitro results um, with in vivo outcomes? Because at the moment, they're not. They're very sort of poorly correlated. Um, and this is due to multiple factors. Obviously, there's a very non-linear kinetics of distribution of phages in blood and tissues. There's this predator-prey responses, like an infectious disease model. Um, host immune responses pay, play a huge factor, which you clearly cannot measure in vitro. Um, and then there's, we know that the multiplicity of infection is important, but actually determining that at the site of infection is often very difficult because many sites of infections are difficult to access or sample um, in these problematic infections. Um, the sort of risk of developing antiphage resistance becomes probably more uh, of an issue when you have very high burden infections. Um, and then something that I'll touch on later is that, you know, most people at the moment are using phages in combination with antibiotics so as adjuncts. Um, but these, these phage antibiotic interactions are very complex and actually kind of difficult to predict and need to be assessed for now anyway, for each antibiotic phage combination to, to see which way it's gonna go. As I said, penetration into biofilms has been well documented, but the, the penetration into granulomas and intracellular penetration is a little bit less resolved. Um, and then the immune modulatory effects, which is um, clearly an area of um, ongoing research for a lot of people as well. And then there's the implementation issue. So at the bedside, what are the, the problems that we have with trying to get phage to our patients? So as um, we alluded to before, access to good manufacturing practice or GMP grade products, that's probably the bottleneck at the moment for most people. Um, and then knowing what it is that you're actually giving to your patient is really important. So you need to have very well characterized phages, not just the phenotypic characterization, but actually full sequencing to know, you know, have you excluded in all the toxins that might be there, resistance genes that might be carrying virulence determinants or lysogeny modules. So this sort of um, detailed information is not always readily available for, for phages that are being provided for, for therapeutic purposes. Um, the companion diagnostics are lacking. And so this is both involves the pretreatment phase of determining your, your selecting your phage, which you know, people are very comfortable with, but actually doing these other um, ancillary testing, you know, your phage antibody combination testing and things like that. And then the monitoring on therapy, which is um, which you know, I believe and many of my colleagues believe is very important. Um, and then there's the, the practical logistics of handling biological entities, um, especially when you come to things like synthetic phages or engineered phages. There are um, licensing rules, regulatory rules about how these need to be contained, who can handle them, and then you know, with what within what kinds of facilities and things like that. Um, clearly, not worried about the human risk, but the environmental impact that might be a concern. Um, so these are all things that need to be thought through for each case, unfortunately. Um, and so you can sort of group these issues, these challenges and solutions into sort of broad categories of what are we doing about diagnostics? What are we doing about therapeutics and how are we, you know, sorting out our biobanking? And all of these factors both interplay and interact with each other. Um, and so these need to be done in parallel. You, know, you can't just work on one section. And all of this is overridden by these um, issues around regulation, which clearly also need to be resolved in parallel as we move forward. So I'm, I'm hoping to um, give a couple of cases, um, which will demonstrate some of these issues, um, the things that we've had to deal with here in Australia. So the first case is a seven-year-old girl, um, DS, who had a motor vehicle accident um, in India in January, 2019. And she had a very, uh, prolonged hospitalization needing multiple surgeries. She had lots of open fractures and required um, hardware to be inserted, including a K wire um, in which went essentially, um, I'm not sure you can see it, basically through her heel up through to her, you know, through her ankle um, and into her tibia. Um, and it was then removed a couple of months later in March, 2019. She developed chronic left heel pain which was worse on weight bearing. Um, and she was basically only able to walk a few steps around the house. She developed a 
uh, a discharge intermittently from a sinus at the bottom of her um, heel um, from around April. Um, and the family were able to fly back to Australia in June 2019 and were immediately seen in the orthopedic clinic. She had a surface swab of the discharge that was coming out of the, um, the sinus and then subsequently the surgeons were able to go in and debride most of this um, you know, inflammatory um, uh, collections and debris. Um, and from the surgical samples as well, we were able to isolate that extremely drug resistant um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, which carried the NDM1 or New Delhi beta lactamase 1, uh, metallo beta lactamase 1 um, uh, gene. And so essentially, you can see the antimicrobial resistance profile. Um, it, it, which was very un, um, unpleasant for us to, in terms of trying to select an antibiotic. And we were essentially only left with astrianam and colistin. And as uh, for the clinicians who are on the call, um, you know, colistin is clearly not something you want to be giving intravenously to a young patient for a long time. It has lots and lots and lots of toxicities. The astrianam only had a sort of an intermediate susceptibility. And this other agent down here, which was susceptible, is called cepidericol, is actually not available in Australia. And so although we were trying to access it on compassionate grounds, um, really all we had was the colistin and the um, astrianam to use. And, and that's what we started with in terms of IV therapy and that was a plan was to give her a long long course um, essentially a, a year of intravenous therapy with these agents the problem was that we really didn't have any options if this didn't work um, and we knew there was a high chance of a long cure there was a, still a lot of um, uh, a lot of inflammation and a lot of areas of infection um, which couldn't really be cleaned out by the surgeon. So often we ask our surgeons to do what we call source control, so get rid of the infection locally. The problem is if they did that, they would be completely destabilizing her ankle and she wouldn't really have any, you know, she wouldn't really be able to walk. Um, and so the only um, option for source control in this patient was an amputation below her knee. Um, and so we spoke to our colleagues, John Idell and Ruby Lynn, who um, Ruby's on the call at the moment, um, and asked for their help. And they contacted Jessica and Jan through phase directory and made a request to, to the international community for therapeutic phases. Um, and we very generously, the community responded and we, there were multiple hits identified and people were willing to give us their phases for use. Um, and it included um, a particular phage, which was a GMP-like product produced by a, a commercial company, Adaptive Phage Therapeutics, who, who kindly agreed to give us the product on compassionate grounds. Um, we went through the local approvals, um, which included, you know, through our drug committee at the hospital, our executive boards, um, you know, talking to our ethicists about using an, you know, um, an unregistered product. Um, in, in a patient. And in October 2019, the patient was admitted um, for intravenous phage therapy, um, which was given either once or twice daily. And I'll talk about that a little bit further down the line for about two weeks. This was started three months into her 12 month course of um, uh, antibiotics. Um, and prior to administration, we did check the um, interaction between the antibiotics we were using, which was glycerin and astranam. With the um, with the phages that um, we were going to use, with the phage that we were going to use, and, and demonstrated that there, although there wasn't synergy, um, that there was no antagonism, there were no inhibitory effects between the antibiotics and the um, and and the phage, which was uh, uh, important for us. Um, and it was really important for us, despite the fact that we were treating this patient on compassionate grounds and based on clinical needs. So this was not a research project. We were doing it because really the patient had no other options. Um, we were determined to learn while we were doing it. And our learning involved trying to understand dosing kinetics, how, you know, about phage distribution um, and as well as bacterial eradication and what is the immune response to the treatment. And this is essentially um, what that looks like. <laughs> so um, I'll try and talk through it. Um, so the patient had a, uh, a fever about eight hours after the first dose of her um, 
so, so sorry, these arrows are the doses of phage and the long arrows are twice daily dosing and the shorter arrows are once daily dosing. Um, and so she had a fever after her first dose and she had a sort of low grade temperatures after the second and third doses and then beyond that didn't have any fevers. Um, she also had quite a um, significant increase in heel pain um, sort of almost immediately after that first, um, you know, 15 hours after that first dose, um, which sort of persisted over that two weeks um, and then improved. She had a rise in her um, inflammatory markers that we can test easily in the lab. So this is the C-reactive protein, which is a non-specific inflammatory marker, um, which coincided with that initial, um, uh, with the initiation of the, the phage therapy. Um, She'd had multiple blood cultures through this, and she did even when she had the high fevers, and we never retrieved um, pseudomonas from the blood cultures, which is expected. You know, she had a very um, deep-seated chronic infection, but we were able to detect actually quite high levels of pseudomonal DNA in her blood, um, and it seemed to correspond with the phage dosing and, and probably re represented our ability to lyse the bacteria. And you can kind of sort of see this peak that went up initially seemed to come down. And when we increased our dosing again, we seemed to get a second peak um, of, of, of pseudomonal DNA. And this blue line is the um, phage DNA. Um, and you can and see that overall, you get that predator prey curve where you've got your um, predators, sorry, your prey um, peaking, and then your predators peaking. And as your prey subsides, your predator subsides in terms of population. Um, okay. And then um, Ruby was able to do a lot of the transcriptomic analyses for us to try and look at these immune responses. Um, so yeah, so we did identify a lot of differentially expressed um, uh, genes that were observed when you compared day zero. And um, so this was just before phage therapy to the, the time points on and after dash therapy. Um, and I guess the, the most uh, pronounced effect was here on day two, where we had a very strong upregulation of um, genes linked to the um, innate immune response, um, which essentially over time seemed to um, subside so that by day 29, which is two weeks after completion of therapy, um, the transcriptomic profile was very similar to, to, to baseline. Um, the differentially expressed genes did persist during the treatment um, and sort of around day 7, 9, 11, you seem to get more of a, um, uh, a adaptive immune response, but this was not statistically um, significant after adjustment. Um, and then this gene set variation analysis um, uh, basically confirmed what we were seeing in the in this hierarchical clustering analysis, um, which again showed that this sort of, um, if you look at the blue line here, this is the innate immune response. Um, you know, you've got this initial response day two, day four, and then a little bit more of a response around day nine, seven, day, day, yeah, day nine. Um, and if you go back to this, it really mirrors the kinetics of the pseudomonal DNA, um, which is very interesting. And so, if you kind of try and put all of that together, you can hypothesize what's happening that you get your phage first hit where you get phage amplification in the target and lots of bacterial lysis. You get a bacterial DNAemia, um, which includes lipopolysaccharide release, which um, um, you know stimulates the toll like receptor four pathways. And so we get what we see clinically, which is that fever right up you know, the beginning and this rise in the C-reactive protein. Um, and then over time, as you get sort of reduced bacterial populations that are, you know, less available um, and plus or minus the bacteria might be developing a um, generalized stress response, um, which you imagine there'll be quite a, a large GSR population within that this sort of very chronic, long-seated, deep-seated infection. Um, and so you get this decline in the innate immune response and the LPS driven um, in, you know, immune response, and you get a decline in your recoverable phage. And when we increased our dose, it's possible that maybe we got to more of those hidden populations 
able to get some more um, bacteriolysis and you get a second surge of uh, bacterial DNA in LPS and you get a second um, round of TLR4 mediated innate immune responses. And as I said, there was a hint for potentially some adaptive immune responses developing in around day seven to day nine, um, which we were able to potentially show in terms of IgG increases, but we don't have the ability to, at the moment, to look specifically for phase specific antibody to, to confirm that. And so overall, um, we had a patient who had started off in July, 2019, um, with a really sort of horrible looking MRI scan and a patient that clinically was very limited by pain. Um, as I said, she could only walk a few steps around the house. Um, despite, you know, three months of intravenous therapy, her MRI was progressing and was actually getting worse. Um, and then we introduced the phage therapy for a couple of weeks. And subjectively, although it, it's hard to prove with a single case, the patient did say that two weeks after having finished the therapy, when we saw her in clinic, she felt a lot better and she was actually able to walk um, unaided with, um, with minimal pain for probably about 100 meters or so, which was um, you know, more than she'd been able to do since before her initial injury. Um, and by the time uh, we stopped all her antibiotics in July 2020, so after 12 months of treatment, she was, um, at, you know, going to the park, climbing playgrounds, um, and, uh, you know, able to walk two blocks to her friend's house completely without any pain. So um, this treatment was definitely successful. Um, how much we can, you know, say we're due to the phage versus obviously a very prolonged course of antibiotics as well, it is limited, um, you know, we're, we're limited in what we can draw in terms of conclusions, um, but it definitely showed that this is feasible and practical and safe. So the second case um, is RP, she's a 12 year old girl whose background is um, cystic fibrosis. Um, she has a Delta um, F508 deletion, which is the most common deletion for cystic fibrosis, but she's heterozygous, so she has a different gene mutation as a second mutation. Um, she has the typical complications that patients with cystic fibrosis have, so pancreatic insufficiency, she's got lots of nasal disease and, and polyps, sorry, sinus disease and nasal polyps. Um, and sort of prior to, to 2015, she was doing reasonably well, so her, this is FEV1, which is her lung function, and it's given as a percentage of what is expected for a patient of this age. And so she was mostly sitting around 85 to 90%, which is reasonable for um, a, a young person with cystic fibrosis. She also has an older brother who's also got cystic fibrosis as well. And in terms of her microbiology, what she was initially getting um, you know, prior to 2015 were, were the usual bacterial pathogens. So she had some methicillin susceptible staph aureus, she had Homophilus influenzae, and she had intermittently some Aspergillus um, fumigatus um, from his sputum. And then from 2015, she started to isolate Mycobacterium abscessus. So um, the Mycobacterium, as I said, was first isolated in December 2015 and then repeatedly isolated thereafter. And again, you can see from the antibiogram um, that it, it had the typical um, antibiogram that you'd expect with uh, a M. abscessus subspecies abscessus um, in terms of its resistance profile. It was highly drip resistant, um, really only sensitive to amikacin and linezolid with the sort of borderline intermediate to resistance to a couple of other, other agents as well. Um, and importantly, uh, the macrolides, which we often rely on for treating abscessus, were, were clearly resistant. So this young patient um, had, uh, sorry, for a second. Um, so she had persistent colonization. So here down the bottom, these orange circles represent um, her uh, positive cultures for M. abscessus, which started end of 2015. Um, and initially for probably the first year, she was just monitored um, to see what happened. And although her FEV1 was maintained, um, she was getting increasing symptoms and her um, chest CT was um, progressively getting worse and showing sort of nodular changes. 
And so in um, sort of early 2017, a decision was made to try and treat this abscessus. Um, and around that point, she started to actually demonstrate a decline in her lung function as well. Um, so she had what would be a sort of a, a typical induction um, uh, of antibiotics. I'm just going to, I don't know if someone quickly check the um, chat. I think I'm getting questions, but I can't check it when I'm slide sharing. So I'm not sure if someone wants to shout out the questions or I can come back to them. We can wait till the end. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so she had three months of induction antibiotics um, with, as you can see, one, you know, five different antibiotics. Um, and then a maintenance period. Um, and despite that, she had persistently um, positive cultures and an ongoing decline in her lung function. Um, some uh, um, additional measures were tried. So she got compassionate access to liposomal amicase. And at the time, it was not really available in Australia. We even tried bedaquiline, which is um, a drug that's used for multi-drug resistant TB and sometimes has some effect in MFCSS as well. Um, and uh, her primary um, physician uh, Paul Robinson also tried inhaled nitric oxide um, uh, as well. But essentially, um, we were unable to affect the natural trajectory of the disease. And so, in sort of um, late 2018, the all treatment was stopped um, essentially due to futility. Um, she did have a trial of itraconazole to try and treat the aspergillus in case allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis was playing a factor in the sort of decline of the lung function, um, but that really didn't have any impact either. Um, and then at that point, uh, so actually a little bit later on in 2020, there was a publication that came out um, from uh, uh, Graham Hatfall and uh, Rebecca Diedrich, who I think is also on the line, um, you know, talking about their ability to use um, mycobacteriophages to control MFCSS in another patient with CF um, post lung transplantation. Um, and so we sent a request to, um, to Graham's lab in the University of Pittsburgh, and they were actually able to identify two mycobacteriophages um, which were active against our patient's um, isolate. So we had one wild type virus called Muddy, and then we had um, a second virus. Um, which unfortunately for us was actually in, according to Australian regulation, considered a genetically modified organism. So this um, phage has a, the helix turn helix at position 33, deleted with the lysogeny module. The parent strain BPS is a temperate phage, which infects readily, but basically produces stable lysogens. Um, and this particular virus that we received was a host range mutant from a previous clinical isolate of an abscessus. Um, which uh, Beth and Graham had been able to, to, um, to isolate. So again, we had to go through the process of getting local approvals for use, but with the addition of needing um, licensing for the use of a genetically modified organism, um, which uh, created um, you know, conditions on our use about precautions um, for containment, environmental containment in particular. So the patient was um, admitted for treatment of MFCSS in June 2020. Um, she had concurrent phage and antimicrobial therapy. Um, the phage therapy involved intrabronchial administration of phage um, on day one of the treatment, so right at the beginning of her admission, and at the end of her admission on day 21, um, and then intravenous phage therapy, which we had planned for 12 months. She also got a combination antibiotic um, regimen based on, you know, as far as we could, on her um, drug susceptibility um, testing that was available. Um, and, and just to say that often, as, as you know, you're limited in how much phase you can give um, by the endotoxin levels, for, particularly for intravenous administration, but because these are mycobacteriophages and, and really don't have any endotoxin, um, we weren't really limited in terms of what we could, what we could give. Um, and which was why we were able to give it both intrabronchially and intravenously at the same time. Um, and again, we were able to um, use our therapeutic monitoring to actually make some real-time changes in how we were dosing um, and using these phages. Um, and so again, these are her, her phage doses, um, either once daily or twice daily. And you can see the kinetics of the, the two phages in her serum. Um, and interestingly, we were actually able to detect, you know, 10 to the 
to 10 to the 3 um, genome copies per mil of phage um, 23 hours often after a dose, so pre, you know, the next dose, um, which probably represents the fact that there was ongoing replication in, in, the, um, in, in the target. Um, and if you look straight after a dose, um, you know, an hour, two hours um, after the dose, you can get probably 10 to the, to the four, 10 to the five um, genome copies per mil of the phage detected in serum. Um, and clearly you get higher levels early on than later on. And hopefully that means that that's because there's fewer bacterial targets as you, as you go through your treatment. Um, in terms of a clinical progress, she tolerated this very well. Her symptoms seemed to improve. Her lung function stabilized, um, did improve, but stabilized. But importantly, for the first time in four years, she was culture negative. She's had multiple, multiple, you know, sputum samples since the commencement of phage, including uh, a bronchoalveolar lavage sample taken, as I said, at that three week time point, and again, um, nine weeks into her treatment, and she's remained culture negative. And actually, in fact, we stopped her phage therapy after 10 months because we were fairly confident that we've eradicated the treatment and she completed her 12 months of antibiotics because that's the standard you know, treatment course for um, MFSSIS, um, lung disease and cystic fibrosis um, and she she's doing quite well um, so what's the trajectory for phage therapy in pediatrics in Australia um, well since these cases we have treated another patient um, and you know essentially we will be on you know continuing to, to treat patients on compassionate grounds and and from this hopefully develop a national registry not just of pediatrics but all but adults but all patients in Australia who are being treated with phage therapy and try and do this using a standardized protocol for both treatment and monitoring. It's clearly really important to actually do clinical trials um, and from a pediatric perspective investigator initiated trials are going to be important because it's really hard to get commercial companies um, interested in including children um, in trials um, and, and it's important also to take advantage of recent developments in innovative trial designs because we're talking about small numbers of patients and we're talking about very um, heterogeneous um, treatment options so even the, you know if you're treating all your MFSs and CF actually each individual patient is getting a different phage um, or a different phage combination and so trying to account for that in traditional clinical trials it doesn't really work um, and importantly, I think because we are a smaller group, um, it is really important that we have these links with our adult colleagues, um, both clinicians and phage researchers, just to ensure that the pediatric agenda is not, it is maintained um, as phage therapy becomes more widely available. Um, so I've got a long list of um, um, you know, people to thank, uh, obviously, uh, for their um, work um, and the help in sort of treating these patients um, and you know, a lot of people that I haven't really named in person but just named their department so this was very very collaborative work um, involved um, and that's it any questions thank you very much Amina that was so great um, I thought it was a really interesting to hear the challenges and solutions from a pediatrician point of view as we don't usually get to hear about that. So that was really um, interesting. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly check the chat, but if anyone has any questions, okay, I'm just going to read out one that was um, sent privately to me. Um, does Dr. Katami know, sorry, know what bacterial host phage muddy was isolated on? Sorry about that. No, I don't, but Becca's on the line and she might. <laughs> I have I unmute powers, Becca. Oh yes, hi. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what the phage was. What was the what was the question? Muddy. Oh, muddy. Oh, sorry. What yeah. it was isolated on? Ah, yes, it was isolated on Mycobacterium smegmatis. Yeah. Very cool. That one. I don't know if there'll be a follow up to that. But yep. <laughs> I think that one came from um, South Africa. Um, it was found underneath a rotting eggplant, I believe. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> I didn't think um, rotting eggplants would be so helpful, but there you go. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. 
and I'm raising my hand to show everyone else that you can you can raise your hand too. Um, I maybe missed this, Amina, um, but how was the phage produced for the M obsessus? Was it um, in the Hatful lab with, was that, and did that end up being fine with the Australian regulators that it was produced that way? Maybe Becca will be here for this one too. <laughs> yeah, so Becca can comment as well, but essentially, yes, what we received were, you know, vials that were ready to use in a patient. Um, Although the Hatful lab is clearly not a GMP registered facility, um, that we had two advantages here. One was, as I said, these are mycobacteria phages. And so our concerns about endotoxin and things like that are, are less. Um, Becca and Graham were able to provide us with um, third party sterility testing and things like that, which were um, sufficient for our um, hospital to say that they were um, you know, of a standard that was acceptable. And the third factor was the fact that these phages or phages from um, uh, Graham's lab had been used clinically before. So there, were, there was evidence of other patients who'd been treated um, without any concerns. And then on top of that, when you factor in that you've got a patient who is looking at um, you know, a fatal infection um, with very limited options, um, you know, she would not have, you know, she was getting to a point that she needed a lot of transplant but she wouldn't get a lung transplant because of this infection. Um, and so it was sort of, you know, we do nothing and this patient's probably going to die um, or we use something that, yes, it's not coming from a GMP facility, but actually we're fairly confident that it's safe. Um, and yes, so Becca had provided us with um, enough paperwork um, to, to make our um, hospital confident with us being able to use that. Amazing, thank you. Um, I just thought I'd remind everyone that you can raise your hand by going to the reactions tab and then there should be a little um, button to say raise hand, but we do have Ian, so I'm just going to ask Ian to unmute so he can ask his question. Hi, uh, yeah, it's a great talk, thanks. Um, so with the Pseudomonas phage, do you know if any work has been done on it uh, to look at how it interacts with biofilms? Um, so this is a phage that was initially isolated in um, Israel, um, and, I, and I listed um, the, the, the guys um, who had initially isolated. It was produced for therapeutic purposes by APT, but phage initially came from a lab in, um, in Jerusalem. Um, I honestly cannot answer that in terms of what other work has been done on this particular phage. As far as I know, the team haven't published on this particular phage separately, um, but I do know that they're planning to. I just don't know what exactly they have that they want to publish, so I don't know about that. Okay, thanks. Um, the next person we have is Joseph Sol. Sorry, I'll let Joseph yeah. unmute, mute myself. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Um, so. I noticed back to the obsessive talk that if I was seeing your slide correctly, um, when you started looking for the phage levels, you saw a peak of both of them early, but one of the peaks for one of those phages was a lot higher than the other one. And I was just wondering, and maybe this is much a question for Becca, but either one of you can comment. Is there something about how the phage interacted with the bacteria in vitro? that explains that, or is there an explanation for that? Yeah, so you're talking about this. Yep. Um, so yeah, so the orange line is muddy and uh, the blue line is BPS. So you're right that the um, the levels that we were detecting is different. Um, Becky can talk more about how these individually act on the target. Um, but I guess what I would say is I wouldn't read too much into this in the sense that um, you know, this is num N of one, you know, we're, we're doing this on one patient. Um, I do have some data from the next patient that we're treating and we're actually getting very, very different results. And so I don't know how much of this is um, different variability in terms of how the phages are interacting with the organism, how the host immune response is interacting with this interplay, how much is just a dosing effect, how much it is, um, you know, tighter changes from dose to dose, slight differences. Like there's so many other variables that I think it's, um, it, we shouldn't try and draw too many conclusions from a single chart. 
what I was trying to, to portray in this is that these are important data to collect so that over time, once we've treated 10 patients or 20 patients, we can start to try and get a better understanding for how do different phages behave in the host? How do these different phages behave, interact with the host and the bacteria? But all of those questions are things that we will understand over time. Um, but I don't think I can give you a good answer right now for why we're getting slightly different kinetics for the two different phages. I don't know, Beck, if you've got anything else to add to that. I think that's good, thank you. Um, we have another question in the chat. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the most recent one. Uh, we have one from Lucy. Can you comment on any differences you observed in immune response in children versus adults receiving um, phage therapy? Yeah, so that's one of the things that we want to look at. And um, Ruby, who is on the line, is trying to look at that. The, the problem is that we don't have adults and children who've received similar phage products. Um, so here in Australia, we've had a whole bunch of adults treated for staph. We have had some adults treated for um, pseudomonas. I don't think transcriptomics were taken from those patients. And then we've got some pediatric patients. And so at the moment, we don't have enough data to make proper comparisons. Again, that this is more just about to highlight what can be done and what um, learning we can achieve. I'm not professing to have any answers at the moment. I think all I'm trying to highlight is that these are really important things to think about and not just say, which I, I feel like some in some centers, it's kind of like, well, let's just give the patient and see what happens and either the patient will get better or not. Um, and that's fine from the patient's perspective. Yeah, they just want to know if they get better or not. But the reality is we do need to understand what it is that we're doing and to try and optimize that because, you know, we're in the age of precision medicine. We're in the age where patients need to get very defined answers and very defined treatments. Um, and so I think these are things that are important to do. At the moment, I don't have really good answers for what they mean exactly. Perfect. And I think that may have answered um, or potentially answered Hesem and Din's um, question as well. Um, just trying to think. Okay, we'll do one last question um, and then we'll do the breakout room. So. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, Belinda, could I ask uh, what the rationale for choosing uh, intra, sorry, I'm not too good. Um, Bronchial? This, uh, yeah, thank you, <laughs> administration. <laughs> I knew I was gonna get um, it wrong. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, sorry, I missed who the question was from, but essentially um, the reasoning was multifold. The first was that um, essentially, um, when we got that first batch, because there was a bit of a delay in um, getting all the approvals, um, particularly the GMO licensing, and at that time we had we were had a, a three month shelf life for the for the doses, um, and so we had some doses that were going to expire um, before we used them up, and because we felt comfortable that we could give more than we needed to. Um, you know, or not needed to, uh, you know, more than what we were giving intravenously, because we probably weren't going to do any harm in terms of the endotoxin levels, um, that we could give more. And so we could have just given more of an IV, but we were going to do a BAL anyway, a, a lavage to have a look. And we just thought, well, actually, if you get the phages right in there, maybe that will have an effect. So that was really the reason to do that was just because we we had it, it was available. We were going to go in there anyway. So we weren't doing the bronch to give it, to give the phage. We were doing the bronch because we needed to do the bronch. Um, but then we're like, well, so now, in, while we're in there, why don't we just administer some topically, essentially? And this uh, the third element of that was the fact that we were unable to give this to give the phages nebulized. And so any way of us being able to administer it directly to the lungs had to be topically. And that was to do with the GMO licensing. Because it's a genetically modified organism, if you nebulize it, you release it quite openly in the environment, you know, which could be exposing anyone. And so we were, our licensing conditions specifically said we could not do that, but they were happy with us administering topically. And so for all of those reasons, we decided to give some intrabronculate. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emine. Um, I think that will wrap that up for now and we'll um, go into the breakout room. So thank you so much. That was really interesting. I think everyone would agree. Um, Jessica, is it okay if I pass over to you to do the breakout room? Yes.
Yeah, no, and before we go, because people might have to go, we'll just say our quick goodbyes for now before we do a one five minute breakout if you wanna stay for it. Um, but thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, we're gonna be back in three weeks time for the next faves uh, number 20. So that's that's gonna be with Dr. Gina Sa and also her patient is gonna be there, John Haverty, who actually got phage therapy from her. So we've got a dual um, talk. So I hope that you can come to that one. I know it's the summer. Well, not for Australia. So you guys can for sure come. <laughs> but, um, and thank you, Amina, so much for sharing your findings and all these amazing things that you've been doing. And yeah, so, so excited to just keep the conversation going about this. So. Uh, and don't forget, uh, Evergreen is coming up in August. and. Abstracts are due soon, so if you want to come and present, uh, you have about four days to submit your abstract. Yeah. And you can sign up at evergreen.phage.directory. Yes, um, you can link that in the chat too. Yeah, Evergreen Phage Meeting, if people haven't heard, is like phage camp for adults, and it's the best place ever. And you can join completely remotely if you want. We're trying to make it so it's a hybrid event that everything will be streamed and we're running the online version. So. Um, that's August 1st to 6th. So uh, abstracts are due on Friday this week. So look into that. Okay, we're gonna go to breakout. I'm gonna open the rooms. If you find yourself alone in a room, don't panic, I'll, I'll help you. <laughs>